The Old Testament reading can be found in Leviticus 25, starting at verse 35. So that's Leviticus 25, starting at verse 35, um, all the way through to verse 46. And the title of the passage is Kindness for Poor Brothers. If your brother becomes poor and cannot maintain himself with you, you shall support him as though he were a stranger and a sojourner, and he shall live with you. Take no interest from him or profit, but fear your God that your brother may live beside you. You shall not lend him your money at interest, nor give him your food for profit. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan, and to be your God. If your brother becomes poor beside you and sells himself to you, you shall not make him serve as a slave. He shall be with you as a hired worker and as a sojourner. He shall serve with you until the year of the Jubilee. Then he shall go out from you, he and his children with him, and go back to his own clan and return to the possession of his fathers. For they are my servants, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as slaves. You shall not rule over him ruthlessly, but shall fear your God. As for your male and female slaves, whom you may have, you may buy male and female slaves from among the nations that are around you. You may also buy from among the strangers who sojourn with you and their clans that are with you, who have been born in the land, and they may be your property. You may bequeath them to your sons after you to inherit as a possession forever. You may make slaves of them, but over your brothers, the people of Israel, you shall not rule one over another ruthlessly. New Testament reading taken from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5 right through verse 9. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleases, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours in, in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. Good oh, morning, everyone. Uh, good, to see you all, see you all. good to see you all here. My name is Alex, and I'm part of the pastoral team here at Cross and Crown. Uh, it would be great if you keep your Bibles open. Uh, we, are, we have been looking at the book of Ephesians and uh, learning to live under God's uh, master plan, uh, learning to live under Christ's uh, lordship. Uh, on your seats, you should have outlines. If you don't have one, uh, there are some more here up front. Uh, there should be some at the back as well. Uh, and it'd be useful for you to follow along because uh, they trace the passage uh, for us. And there's also discussion questions at the end which we use uh, after uh, the service together. Uh, we are ca coming to God's word, so uh, we will need God's help to understand it. Uh, so why don't we pray together and ask him for help as we uh, uh, read his word together. Let's pray. Uh, our Heavenly Father, we praise you uh, for your loving kindness uh, shown to us uh, through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Thank you also for preserving this portion of your word to us. And as we sit under it now, uh, please, by your Holy Spirit, uh, give us understanding uh, that we might better live under Christ's Lordship in our work relationships. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, true story. Uh, the factory manager walks into the office and loudly confronts one of his workers, uh, asking for results. Uh, he also confronts him in full view of other colleagues. Uh, the manager then walks off and slams the door. 
Another true story, uh, a colleague quickly closes the windows on his computer, uh, which were not work related. And very quickly, he put up his uh, design software window. Why? Uh, because he could hear his manager's voice uh, in the next cubicle. I'm sure you know other similar experiences, uh, seeing this uh, cat and mouse dynamic at work. Uh, for workers, there's gossip or complaints against bosses. Uh, for managers, it's uh, their frustration over their subordinates' productivity. Uh, even if you're not employed, uh, you are still a customer at Lotus or a customer at a hawker center. Uh, indirectly, you're a boss there. Or you might be here and you're an employer of a helper at home. Now, of course, not all, not all work relationships are negative. Uh, there can be good and healthy ones as well. Uh, but overall, uh, the sense is that there is potential for tension all around, isn't it? Uh, managers with workers, workers with managers. But what difference does it make when Christ is Lord. And what difference does it make when Christ is Lord? Uh, well, back in chapter 1, uh, God has seated Christ at the right hand, at his right hand in the heavenly places. Uh, Christ is then far above all, uh, head over all things, uh, head over the church. Uh, so Christ is Lord over all, in other words, uh, Lord over us. But then what difference does that, does that make, uh, even at our workplace or at home? Well, we'll see in today's passage that it makes every difference. Uh, every difference from personal attitude to work attitude. Every difference uh, from workers to managers. Uh, we'll see today that knowing Christ as Lord uh, servants obey sincerely and masters do good. Knowing Christ as Lord, workers obey sincerely and managers do good. And in store for us is a promised reward from the Lord himself. And all of these, as we look at them, uh, they help us to live with reverence for Christ. Uh, reverence for Christ every day. Uh, in our workplaces. As we, look, as we have a closer look, uh, let's remind ourselves also of what we've learned so far uh, here in Ephesians. Uh, in chapter 1, verse 10, uh, God's master plan is to unite all things in Christ, uh, to unite all things under the lordship of Christ. And that includes us, uh, those redeemed through Christ, Christ's blood, are those reconciled to God through the cross of Christ. Christ is our Savior through faith, and His love for us is all-surpassing. Uh, that's what we've been looking at, uh, but we'll also be looking at Christ is our Lord. Uh, ever since chapter 4, uh, we've been learning that the right response uh, to Christ's Lordship uh, is reverence for Christ. Uh, reverence for Christ in chapter 5, verse 21. Uh, and that reverence includes a few things that we saw this recent weeks. Uh, it includes wives submitting to their husbands, uh, and husbands loving their wives. Uh, it includes young children obeying their parents, and fathers raising them to know Christ. And the last relationship is today's. Uh, between bond servants and masters, between workers and managers or bosses. Now, those words are a little bit odd, uh, bond servants and masters. Uh, so a quick word here is helpful about it. Uh, the idea of servants or bond servants and masters is an old social structure, uh, which we don't see uh, much today. Uh, although it was legal at the time, uh, about 2,000 years ago, uh, Paul, the author, doesn't condone it. Uh, in fact, it is because of Paul's teachings 
uh, that slavery became illegal uh, in many countries today. But uh, the closest situation to today's passage uh, is the employee-employer relationship, uh, the relationship between workers and managers. And as we'll see, uh, these commands uh, in today's context are still very relevant. Uh, so let's start with Paul's uh, instructions to workers first, to obey sincerely, knowing Christ as Lord. You see that in your outlines. Uh, and there he touches on our personal attitude, work attitude, uh, but also the Lord's reward. Uh, come look with me as well uh, at verse 5 in your Bibles. Uh, look with me at verse 5. It says there, uh, Bond servants, uh, obey your earthly masters uh, with fear and trembling, uh, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Uh, here's a hard command, isn't it? Uh, it's not just carrying out what our managers say, uh, but it's even having to have the right personal attitude towards them. Uh, the attitude of fear and trembling means proper respect for them. Uh, the attitude of sincerity from the heart uh, means it's not just all for show. It's the kind of attitude that we have towards Christ, uh, respectfully and sincerely obeying Him. And that's the attitude we have to have towards our managers. But still, I think it's one of the hardest commands here. How can you respect a manager who hasn't shown you respect? Uh, how can you respect someone who criticizes you in front of your colleagues? And then how can you be sincere uh, if your manager hasn't been sincere? Uh, if he or she practices favoritism? purposely giving good projects to the favorite while you are stuck with small projects. Uh, purposely giving others the easier classes with better students while you have the difficult classes. Letting someone have time off or getting away from work while you have to stay. How can you respect and be sincere towards such managers? And perhaps deep inside us as well, uh, we also think that, hey, uh, we could be man better managers than them. Uh, we can do a better job than they can. That we wouldn't mess up like they have. But Paul here says that you can and you should respect your managers. And it's because your respect and sincerity towards them extends beyond, it extends to respect and sincerity towards Christ. Your personal attitude towards bosses is part of your personal attitude towards Christ. Let me say that again. Your personal attitude towards your bosses is your personal attitude towards Christ. And we see this in, in, in chapter 5, verse 21. But we see submission to one another is out of reverence for Christ. Submission to one another is out of sincere respect to the Lord Jesus Christ. So, submission to managers is out of respect and sincerity to the Lord Christ himself. Now, this may not be the best analogy, but uh, I think it's a little bit like me when I go to my favorite uh, my, uh, my favorite restaurant. Uh, I go there so often that the owner knows me, knows my name, and I know his name. But part of my friendship with the boss there, with the owner there, uh, should actually include my friendliness to his waiters, uh, the people who work for him, the people who serve me uh, th their food. Uh, to some extent, my respect for his waiters is also out of my respect for him, for a friend, for the owner of the restaurant. 
In the same way, our respect for managers is also out of our respect for Christ. So what then does that respect and sincerity look like? Oh, well, sincerity is expanded further in verses 6 and 7, which we'll look at shortly. But respect for managers, uh, what would that look like? I think that can look like you saying hello when they are nearby, uh, rather than avoiding them. Our respect can look like you keeping silent and not joining in the gossip uh, when other colleagues complain about your bosses. Our respect can look like you maybe uh, accepting the work that he or she gives you and not challenging their every decision or not bossing a weak manager around. I respect your managers uh, out of reverence for Christ. But the Bible is realistic as well. Uh, your respect for managers won't change uh, your situation necessarily. Uh, your respect for managers uh, won't make your managers love you. Uh, and so 1 Peter gives us a reason, a reason to endure uh, this particular suffering. Uh, it's because we are following Christ's excellent example. Uh, listen to what uh, 1 Peter 2 says. Uh, 1 Peter 2, chapter 2. Uh, verses 18 and 19, all the way to 21, 24. Uh, let me read that for you. 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, Servants, uh, be subject to your masters with all respect, uh, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Uh, for this is, the, this is a gracious thing. Uh, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Uh, verse 21, uh, for to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, uh, leaving you an example, uh, so that you might follow in his footsteps. Uh, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Uh, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on a tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And by his wounds we have been healed. What does all this mean? Well, it means that to respect but endure suffering our under managers is actually to follow the excellent example of Christ. Of Christ who not only endured suffering, but entrusted himself to God the judge and bore our sins on the cross. So, sincere respect and obedience to managers is not only out of reverence for Christ, uh, we are also following Christ's excellent example especially when enduring suffering. Our personal attitude towards managers doesn't just stop there. It also flows out to our work attitude, our working as to the Lord. Look again, look again with me from verse 5 on through, on through verse 7. Verse 5. A bond servant, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling and with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Uh, not by the way of eye service, as people please us, but as bond servants of Christ, are uh, doing the will of God from the heart, uh, rendering service with a good will, as to the Lord and not to man. So, uh, if Christ is Lord, what should our work attitude be? Well, on the one hand, uh, it's not working in a way where you quickly look busy when the boss is around, but you do much less when he's not looking. 
But on the other hand, it's also not doing the, your very best. It's not just about doing your very best to meet your manager's expectations. Ultimately, as servants of Christ, uh, we, are be, we are to be doing God's will. Uh, working as though we are serving Christ himself and not man. And that means working from the heart, serving with good will. Uh, I think of this as being very similar to uh, making a gift for someone. Uh, so when I make a birthday card for my wife, Linda, uh, I try to put in lots of thought into the design, the colors, and the material. Uh, I try to draw and cut neatly, uh, no crooked lines, uh, no pencil marks, uh, so that it all looks nice and tidy. But the card is not the end goal. Uh, you being impressed is not my purpose either. Ultimately, uh, that birthday card is for my wife. It's for her birthday. And in the same way, uh, when you're teaching at a school or uh, when you're teaching at a school, uh, you're serving beyond just the students, beyond their parents or beyond your head teacher. Uh, you are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Or when you're managing a project, uh, you are serving beyond your customers, beyond the upper management. Uh, you are serving the Lord. Uh, whether you're in marketing or sales or accounting, admin, engineering or training, you are serving the Lord. So as best you can, your work attitude should be to give full attention to your work, whether or not your boss is looking. As best you can, I give attention to the quality of your products or the quality of your service. I don't compromise for your own ease. I serve the Lord as best you can. And as we serve the Lord Jesus Christ, obeying our manager sincerely, uh, we serve knowing the promised reward. In verse 8, uh, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. A parallel verse in Colossians clarifies what we receive here. What we receive here is we receive from the Lord Jesus as a reward, the rich eternal inheritance in God's kingdom. I will receive this inheritance at the end of this age when Jesus returns to judge. And this reward, it says here, is for whatever good anyone does. Uh, even the good uh, that's not seen by others or not, recognizes, not recognized by your bosses. And now it's worth uh, pausing for a little while to clarify what these good deeds or good works are. Uh, these good works are not just any and all good works, but they, these good works are, are of those who have been saved by God out of His grace. Uh, they are works of those who have been created in Christ Jesus. Uh, back a few chapters, in chapter 2, verse 10, it says there that we are God's workmanship, are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And that means two things here. Two things. Uh, first, uh, we are not saved by God because of our good works. Instead, we have been saved by God for good works. 
We are now saved by God because of good works. We are saved by God for good works. And so our motivation for good works is not to earn God's grace. It's a response to God's grace that he showed us in Christ. And Christ will reward those he, sa he has saved as they respond with good works. And so first, we've been saved by God for good works. Second, second, it means that not all who do good works will be rewarded by the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. Not all who do good works will be rewarded by the Lord Jesus Christ. It is only those who have been saved by God, who have trusted in His Son Jesus, believing in His death for our sins, only they will be rewarded by He Himself. Only they will be rewarded by the Lord Jesus, are rewarded with His future kingdom's inheritance, rewarded with all the goodness of God Himself. So if you are here, and if you are someone who strives to do good works, are whether hoping for some reward at the end or not expecting any reward at all, but you haven't trusted in Jesus before, then I hope you don't miss out on the reward worth having. Don't miss out on the reward worth having. Because here's a reward from the Lord Jesus, who is head over all things. And here is reward from the Savior Jesus. Uh, whose love for us is all surpassing. Uh, here is reward that contains all of God's goodness. Uh, don't miss out on this great reward worth having. Will you put your trust in Jesus? Will you put your trust in Jesus because He provides for both the forgiveness of sins but also the reward for all the good works that you do in response to his salvation. I don't miss out on this uh, eternal reward worth having. Come and put your trust in Jesus. Knowing Christ as Lord, workers obey sincerely, doing good works, which Christ will reward. Uh, last but not least, uh, the last verse addresses masters or, or managers or bosses in today's context. Uh, knowing Christ as Lord, uh, managers do good. Uh, look with me uh, at verse 9. Uh, verse 9 in Ephesians 6. And there it says, uh, Masters, uh, do the same to them. And stop your threatening." Uh, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Uh, so just like the workers, managers also are to have the right personal attitude. Uh, masters do the same to them. Uh, means masters do good to their workers. Just as their workers do good work, which benefit their managers. Uh, Paul also adds here that uh, masters should stop threatening their servants. Uh, we saw some of that uh, in, an, in, an old, in an older time in Leviticus 25 just now. Uh, masters treating their slaves, treating their workers well out of fear for God. Now, if you step back, if you step back uh, and, and look back at these two commands, uh, you see that underlying these two commands uh, is the right use of authority, isn't it? The right use of authority. Uh, if you're a manager or a head of a company, uh, you have authority over those who report to you, those who work for you. Uh, but your temptation might be 
and to use authority wrongly, either to your own advantage or to the disadvantage of your workers. Uh, you might be driving for results, uh, driving for productivity or for profits, about going about in, a, in ways that either harm your employees or going about in ways that make them fearful of you. Now, this doesn't mean that there's no room for honest feedback. But if you can differentiate that they fear you rather than sincerely respect you, then something has gone wrong. If you notice that they fear you rather than sincerely respect you, then you need to reevaluate how you've been using your authority. Does it match with how Jesus used his authority? Does it match with how he used authority to do good and not harm? To save life and not kill? Our managers, bosses, use your authority rightly and for the good of those who work for you. And not just following Christ's example, but here it's also knowing Christ your Lord is in heaven, verse 9. And that means Christ Jesus is watching you, watching over your use of authority. And the warning is that Christ will be impartial, impartial in his assessment of us. Uh, so what does that look like, uh, doing good as managers and bosses? Uh, what are some ways uh, that you can use your authority rightly? Uh, well, if you're a businessman, you can use your authority uh, to share a higher percentage of profits with your employees. Uh, sharing a higher percentage of profits. Uh, yes, I think you need to consider your cost structure. Uh, you need to consider uh, reinvestment. Wherever you can, do good and share God's blessings with them. Uh, perhaps you're a manager with subordinates. Uh, then maybe twice a year, you're in a position to justify their promotion or to justify their salary increase. Uh, when is that time? Uh, put in real effort. Be well prepared. Uh, don't give up so easily uh, for the good of those under you. Uh, sometimes doing good means using a much softer approach. A softer approach when a worker isn't performing. Uh, perhaps is genuinely trying to understand what's underlying. Uh, what's going on in his or her life? Has there been a crisis? Uh, will you see him or, him or her as a person to do good to and not as a problem to solve? See him, him or her as a person to be good towards. Uh, managers with workers, workers with managers, Yes, there's potential for tension all around, no doubt. But knowing Christ as Lord makes every difference, doesn't it? Are you a worker? Then let your knowing of Christ change your personal attitude to become sincere respect for your bosses. Let it change your work attitude to become work for Christ. Are you a manager? Then let your knowing of Christ change your use of authority to do good to your employees. You also have a master in heaven. I do all of these out of reverence for Christ who used his authority to suffer so that he can do good to us and save us. 
Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, uh, hearing these words from the scriptures today, uh, we confess that we've not always respected or been sincere with our managers. Uh, we've confessed that we've not always used our authority to do good for our workers. Uh, Father God, please forgive us of our sins. Uh, as those who know Christ as our Lord, please help us uh, with our personal and work attitudes. Uh, please help us to rightly use authority. Please help us that we might uh, revere our Lord Jesus Christ, sincerely respect him and obey him, that we might follow in his excellent example. In his name we pray. Amen.